Hey, welcome to the Secret Squirrel Ladies Hour. Um, I'm going to bring the ladies in. Surprise. Okay, here we go. Let me find them. We're going to start with Jan Walsh from Ofka, New Zealand. Hi, Jan. Hi. And we're going to bring in Liana. Liana. And last but never least, Miss Lindsay Stroud. Hi, Linz. Hello. <laughs> Okay, welcome to Sweet Wit. Sweet Wit, I can speak. It's been a long week. <laughs> welcome to Secret Squirrel. Um, is it, I'm going to say something very sexist right now. And I'm sorry, Ignacio, but I'm going to say it. Usually men complain that we talk too much and they have to wait around for us. Hmm. Anyway, um, this is our time to say whatever we feel like saying. So who would like to start? Anybody? Bueller? I would, but I'm going to take up a bit of time. Okay, cool. Lindsay, you said you had some updates for us. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, I've been following along, um, and it's really interesting because you're not seeing a lot of news on COP9 on the Google search. But I'm, I'm getting a lot of news out of different countries, and I'm noticing this theme where ministries of different departments are doing more than promoting tobacco harm reduction than their health you know, ministers are just pretty yeah. amazing. But it goes back down to this whole notion that, and it's really kind of scary too, that like tobacco companies are more interested in providing safer products than public health is, um, you know, and that's just, it's like, it, what did I put on Facebook? I was like, you know, that's kind of like big oil, you know, like signing the, you know, doing the green new deal, them writing it, you know, it's amazing. Um, but watching, I know Brazil, and we, you guys just followed up with that last panel. So Brazil's, um, you know, their department, um, a labor guy, I believe, like came out, you know, and um, is mad at their Department of Health delegation because apparently going into COP9, they were trying to promote tobacco harm reduction. They actually went and reached out to the tobacco companies to ask them about the COP9 agenda. And so their delegation, I guess, did a 180 that they're not really happy about. So, and watching, that's just like my update for what I had today on what's going on. So it's just, it's uh, scary. And like, thank God that we have like, you know, two years to kind of like mobilize all the consumers and, you know, get the science out um, one way or the other it'll happen. Well, that kind of brings me up to a point of something that I wanted to talk about right now. Oh, screen's changing again. Yeah, just to trip me up. Anyway, thanks, Nye. Um how do you think we can get more women? You know how like the boys have their shows, like, you know, the Latin boys have their shows and Patrick has his shows. How do you think we can get ourselves a little more visible? And do you think that it would be something that would provide just a different angle? Because I think Boobs. we have a different angle to all of this. Yeah. Boobs. I'm I'm sorry. Yeah. boobs. Nobody wants to see my boobs. <laughs> nice one, Linz. No one wants to see even, my, even if you watch the, um, my boyfriend watches like some of these gaming girls, you know, and they, they like this one girl got fake boobs and she talks about it. But um, I think that, yeah, you're right. I think overall women are significantly absent um, in tobacco harm reduction, which is unfortunate because there's so many users of them. Yeah. Jan, you got to take on that? Unmute. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's a hard one, really. Um yeah, I don't know, actually. Yeah. Oops, um, I'm telling you, so. I, yeah, <laughs> I, I, you know, the problem is that, like, you know, I'm not exactly 20 any longer, and even when I was, I didn't have much, so, you know. <laughs> I mean, but, I, you know, the thing is, we approach things differently than the guys, and that's not a sexist thing. That's just fact, and we all know that. Um like, for example, Jan, when you and I went to Parliament, you know, and we were tromping around the beehive, I, you remember the looks on their faces when they met us? They were like, because yeah. they don't expect us. So, yeah. Yeah, they didn't expect a couple of middle-aged women, really, did they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with, what, four degrees between us. Um, yeah, you know, I, it, it's... One of the issues that I see with a lot of, you know, when dealing with politicians and dealing with public health people, you know, is they, they have this expectation of what a vapor is. And then they have this expectation of what an advocate is. And we don't fit those boxes. No. 
you know? Well, and also, I think women, too, um, I mean, I especially saw here in the States um, last year with the PMTA, that was a bunch of women running that, you know? We don't get caught up in a lot of stuff. It's kind of, I think we tend to be single folk, you know, focused and we get stuff done. It's like, okay, well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do it and don't get caught into any of the, you know, whatever nonsense that's going on in the background. Um, and especially like, I always look at the PMTA sharing group, you know, it's Char Owen who pretty much did it, you know, created all these programs. And it was a couple of us chicks behind the scenes that were like helping, you know, coordinate all of these small companies. Um, unfortunately, you know, the FDA did their thing that they did, but it did give them another year to be on the market legally. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the ego thing. I think it's a lack of ego. Yeah, we I mean, don't care. Yeah, we just, we're, I mean, I'm more of just like, get it done. I really don't care. <laughs> you know, I don't care who takes, you know, who takes credit. Just get it done, get it out there, whatever. Yeah, I think that is a big, you know, Linz, I think that's a very big part of it is that a lot of us are working behind the scenes for the most part. I mean, this was painful for me. Let's be honest. I'm on camera. I'm like, whoa. You know, I mean, the advocate's voice is painful for me. Um, but, you know, it, it, I realize that it's something beyond me. So, you know, I've just got to suck it up. I mean, Jan's an introvert and we've got Jan on camera. That in, in, in and of itself is just like, wow, because. <laughs> yeah, I told you how you did this. <laughs> <laughs> I asked you nicely. Um, well, you did. But, yeah, it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not about us. No. It's, it's in, as individuals, you know. And, but yet, because we're not like that, I think our voices are not very well heard. And I think True. we need to change that. Liana, speak, my love. It's not about our egos, but it is about our lives. So it is very much about us. And the nice thing about the small talk shows is it gives you the opportunity to get to know someone on a more intimate basis um, when they do interviews and include ordinary consumers and talk about that there, it's a, it's a more relaxed atmosphere. Um, just like the segment that Son of Liberty Radio presented with the people um, dealing with mental health issues, neurodiversity as the NICE label is, um, and how nicotine helps them function like me. Um, it, it, it gave it a humanization. It yeah. let people begin to care. And that's where I think we can make the difference is how can we get someone to more deeply care? So getting more into the humanizations, not just the little short videos specifically about, about vaping, but getting to know people as individuals, putting yourself on front street. I can't tell you. I lost my father yesterday. Okay, I lost my father, my mother less than a year ago. I can't tell you, even before that happened, the amount of nerve it took me as an ordinary consumer in, in my particular little unique place, just like everybody's is unique, to get on camera before my father passed away. Okay, watching it repeat over and over again. And I'm like, thank God for the experts and the advocates and the scientists and the doctors around me. Like it's phenomenal, but I didn't really get to say what I wanted to say because I really have to think about things. You know, I do have ADHD. It does require a lot of like hyper focusing on something that I care about and I'm passionate about. I have to think about what I'm going to say beforehand that I didn't come on here with a script tonight. But I want to humanize what's going on. And if I cry, forgive me. It's I'm an emotional bag, but that's You're what allowed. I came on here to do. And I appreciate the opportunity and I appreciate the support of whoever's around me. Females, not females. Um, the, the people that are tuning in that will tune in later. I want to humanize it. So if I may... I want to tell you guys a little bit about myself. Is that okay? Go for it. The floor is yours, darling. Go on. All right. Well, my father smoked. Okay. And he was a functional, highly functional drug addict that was self-medicating because he knew no better how to do so. Okay. ADHD, we all know stimulants work. So he was doing the illegal thing. 
and destroying his own mind. And he was a, a solo lone wolf kind of guy. All right. He's not the kind of guy that's ever going to tune into something like this. Anybody that's going to know that there are different options available, except what he may see when he walks into a store to pick up a pack of cigarettes, that there's something else there. Um, and he isolated the last seven years of his life, hiding in secret and in shame, um, smoking like a chimney, um, couldn't afford regular cigarettes when it got to the point that he couldn't afford his Marlboros and was rolling his own until his hands couldn't like roll his own, you know, and he was mentally a mess at his own hands, but he knew what worked for him. My grandmother, bless her heart. And my grandfather, really, really good, sweet people, wholesome people, just that, just amazing people. Sixth grade educations, but wonderful people, okay, that did their own thing in, in missionary work for the Navajo Indians. My dad stayed with them often, so there was a lot of secondhand smoke, a lot, in a trailer, okay? And I don't know if you guys understand what a, a trailer is. What being, you know, high end white class, uh, white trash I grew is. Up on one. Yeah. All right. Yeah. We get ventilation. Girls, we'll, yeah. We'll, yes. The way that smoke goes in there, even if he's in another room with a little smoke eater ashtray, it's throughout the house. You know, my grandma was exposed to it a lot. She smoked maybe a month and a half of her entire life back when it was really cool. And it wasn't for her. She, she didn't need nicotine, um, but she was around a lot of secondhand smoke. I lost my grandmother to lung cancer, all right? My grandfather died from heart issues, but I lost my grandmother to lung cancer. She suffocated on her way out from secondhand smoke. And even though I grew up around it, I didn't pick it up. I had no idea that, you know, I wanna go and be a smoker until you stuck me in a work environment. I grew up an only child, I was abused. I was moved around a lot. I was part of the system. Um, I had some pretty horrific things happen to me. Drugs were very, very appealing. Smoked weed with my dad. And I was just in and out of stepdads and marriages and divorces. It was just a stereotypical, horrific upbringing. And so drugs were really appealing. The whole, I want to feel normal, I want to fit in, and I'm hyper, I'm bouncing off the walls, but I'm also gifted. I'm smart. I get good grades no matter where you place me, even though I don't have the support group or know how to have friends. My mom didn't have friends. I didn't learn any of those normal social activities. So when I tell you I'm like full of nerve right now, I'm telling you the truth. I'm just full of it. And I've got nine milligrams of nicotine instead of my normal three. To help me get through this. So bear with me. Fine. Focus is difficult. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I have all this adversity and yet I'm just waiting to be plucked up and, uh, and applied somewhere in the right way. I try the Navy. Okay. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, it, they, they took away all the drugs and I'm left with smoking and drinking. And I'm, I, alcoholism skipped my family, my generation, not my family. It skipped my generation. Let me reiterate. Sorry. Um, so I have cigarettes and I had drinking every night after I was done with school. Didn't study, didn't do my homework, still scored very high on all my testing. And I'm a hot social mess. I do not fit into the curriculum that the military had for me. I didn't. Not at all. And I'm smoking like a chimney. And when I first started, by the way, I, I diverged. Um, I started at Kentucky Fried Chicken, my first summer job when I had to deal with the public. Other, my peers were smoking. I tried it and something clicked. And it was an unfiltered camel cigarette. Oh God, Boom. I remember those. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And whenever I got stressed, there was a the nicotine. I didn't see all those patterns and understand what's going on or understand all the science behind it until it's presented to me in the last few years. But now it all makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, my mom also lived with a smoker before the last few years of her life. 
he smoked in the house and he smoked a lot. And um, she got lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, liver cancer. It spread everywhere. It was a couple of the smoking and the foods that she was choosing to cook for him. But then she moved out on her own and she had no idea that this had started in her body. My mom also, a lone wolf just like my father, liked to just be in her own little world in a little tiny village, a little tiny cottage in a little tiny like shingle town, okay, <laughs> with her garden and keep to herself and interact very little because it was new to her. She, she didn't know the things that we know. She, she got online for a while and then chose to isolate herself. So she didn't have educated choices or decisions or anybody saying like, hey, you know, something might be going on with your health and you should take care of it. She just didn't. Mm -hmm. But that cancer had already started. And so I lost her December of last year. And then I was planning a trip to go see my dad this weekend. And I lost him yesterday. I got the call. You know, so everything I bought for him, you know, just got donated. I donated the last of it today. And I'm happy that he's in a better place, but let me get this straight. If he had known that there was a choice and he could have had his nicotine delivered to him in a safer way, that was easy, that he didn't have to roll and not suffer the consequences, he would have been around longer, a lot longer. But he didn't. So, you know, he was in a care home, by the way, in California. And my finances don't, didn't permit me to go because I put my money elsewhere, which takes me to another thing. Um, I was in recovery for a lot of years, like 13. And I realized self-medicating in different ways, like with CBD, very small amounts of THC and nicotine, not only helped my physical problems, but helped my mental issues. And I'm a better doctor at myself than others. I've tried different medications for ADHD. The side effects are horrible, just like cigarettes. The side effects are horrible, the side effects. But let me isolate this one component and find out what, what works for me. So I was introduced to vaping by some people that came over to the house one day. And they had, um, and they had, um, they had devices, big, big dual battery mods like this. Not this brand, but big dual battery mods. All kinds of liquids. Zero, three milligram, six milligram. And I had a really, a very stereotypical result. I'm going to choke on it. It's going to make me cough. Like, it's not going to work for me. Because um, I took a big hit off a mod that's much too big for a starter instead of something like this. Um, and, I, you know, I choked and I coughed and... I got scoffed at it and went right back to this. And I'm, I brought it with me because I keep this in my glove box, okay? That was 2018. This is what I smoked. This is how I romanced it, okay? The case has my name and my phone number on it. This still hasn't changed. Leather case. Fancy lighters. I liked, I liked fancy things. I, I was big into my ritual. These are menthol Swisher Sweet Cigarillos. This was this was it. This is the last of that pack. They're so stale. You can't even smell. Well, you can still smell. Still smell a little sweet. All right. The ritual was important. The hand mouth fixation was important. The social aspect was important. Um, everything. That, the fact that it helped me be calm enough to just talk to people was important. It all mattered. And it still does. I went back to smoking those and I got real sick. And my doctor said... Um, Despite the chronic bronchitis, repeat upper respiratory infections, the asthma that I had to use an inhaler for three times a day, he said, you have the beginnings of COPD. And I thought, well, you know, I guess, uh, you know, I'm wheezing all the time. And uh, I said, I guess it's time for me to go revisit this vaping thing. Let me go revisit it. So I went home and... I smelled all the liquids and they were really sweet, by the way. I'm like real sensitive to like way too much sweetener. <laughs> and uh, I tried it and I put those, those cigarillos down and this time it worked. 
I just had to adjust my airflow. I had the girl come back to my house and I said, would you sit down and show me all the ins and outs of this? And I asked for that same education, that custom education that vape shops, our brick and mortars give to us, did and used to, and some of them still do give to us. They sat down and she told me how to work that. And it was, it worked. For once I was able to successfully quit. Patches burn my skin. Gum makes my stomach upset, that nicotine in my stomach. This was finally a delivery system that was brilliant. And no, I'm not reading comments right now, you guys. This is hard enough. It worked and it worked so well for a few months. And I decided if I'm not happy with these commercial liquids, I'm gonna mix my own. And then I got involved and embraced lovingly on so many different platforms by the DIY community. And I'm full of fire and vigor and knew what kind of sweeteners I wanted to use and just like went all out. And uh, the good credit that I had built over my years, I invested in flavors, VG, PG, beakers, scales, all this stuff, the tools. I, I spent an obscene amount of money in brick and mortar shops just to get a lesson on how to build my own coils. And then the advocates were creeping in. And I met Paul with 2501 Labs now, Paul Blumeyer. And he started showing me the bigger picture about what's going on and what we're up against. Every day we're talking. He's teaching me. He's mentoring me. He says, I want you to pull out a DIY. You have a gift. And you could get into research and development. You could make recipes to help have other people something that they enjoy. And I'm like, really? Well, somebody believed in me and snatched me up. They, they saw something, some potential. And I got out of the DIY community. That was also part of my midlife crisis because I was all stuck on what I looked like and the boobs and like all that. It was stupid. Um, I got out of that. I got divorced. I came here to this room that I'm in right now. And I set up shop. And I had blueprint drawers just full of flavors. And then all of a sudden, they moved the goalposts on that. Now you got to change flavors. Okay. Now you can only work with flavor houses that have the right paperwork and are willing to submit and expose their technology and their chemistry to all these agencies to make it right. Okay. And, and now, and, and since this is going to be on a worldwide international platform, you you can you can have this, but you can't have that. So everything that I'm vaping now and mix now and all these things that you see here are TPD compliant and free of sucralose. And nobody knows this. Nobody knows what I'm doing. Nobody knows how many thousands, tens of thousands of dollars that I've invested in this. I part of beat myself up is part of the reason I couldn't go see my dad. All I know is I have found something. That I'm willing to stand up for. And in the very, very get-go, I get the opportunity to go to the rally. And I was sponsored by Seven Cities Vapes and allowed to stay at their house because it's my ex-husband's sister's husband that's one of the owners. He says, come stay with us. I'll pay for your plane ticket. Let's go. Here I am in a rally. And then I'm introduced to this wonderful world of advocates that are around me right now. Absolutely awesome. Okay. And Paul keeps feeding me this information. He's telling me everything that's going on around the world. And my, my little tiny bubble that I live in is just expanded to a global level. And I am part of an incredible family that supports, educates, doesn't judge, and is teaching me what I can and can't do. And on the outside of this very knowledgeable bubble, these amazing people is a whole force of people with a very small percentage that is trying to make the decisions for the rest of us. With all this money to back it up. Meanwhile, for what, 10 years, we've been vaping and nobody's died from the way you know, our vaping, our safer nicotine delivery system, and you're going to come in and try to tell us 
how to do things and keep making it so hard. I'm watching people lose their businesses, their shops, everything. I'm watching people dying and hearing about it because I got into social media and I started friending so many vapors and so many advocates that I don't know from around the world. And I'm reading their day-to-day -day comments. I'm listening to their struggles and it makes my heart ache. It's killing us. I'm to sit back and, and hear this cop nine make decisions that will not allow in the very scientists and advocates and people that I would trust with my life to even be a part of it? Really? You asked what I wanted to say to cop nine? Would you like it if I was a billionaire and I came in and all of a sudden uh, behind the guise of COVID started making decisions for you that if I influenced everybody on social media to think that caffeine was the enemy, for instance, and you're going about your everyday life and you drive up to, you know, Starbucks or whatever coffee shop you have in your country or even to the grocery store. And this is a uh, reduced caffeine coffee and you can only get it in these two flavors and everything changed because I have like changed the rules for you. Would you like that? Would you like it if I went into your grocery stores and I don't have any, uh, you know, weight problems and I've got all this money and I told everybody, this is what you should do. And this is what's right for you. And I made decisions and you go in your grocery store and your foods are suddenly changed because of a decision that I made for you without hearing your voice on it. We know what's good for our bodies. I know what works for my mental health. I have seen the results. My doctor did a chest x-ray for a, a surgery within six months of me stopping vaping. My lungs are spotless. I haven't had to touch an inhaler for four months since I started. The wheezing is gone. I haven't even got the cold or the flu since I started vaping. Nothing. I know what works for me. I am set up here that I could easily become a black market and yet I am struggling to even begin to have skin in the game to do things legally, to make things clean, to help them be sweetened in such a way that has no, no detriment to your health, but balanced where everybody still gets the flavors that they want. Monk fruit and stevia, proper balances. Yes, I said that in public. It makes a great sweetener. I have to study burn points and chemistry and things that I've never even learned about before. I've had to beg a flavor house to supply me with the right things. And they have. We're trying to do this right. Everybody deserves to be heard because there's more people just like me. And the common consumer that isn't going to know anything except all of a sudden their vape shop closed. And they can't get what they need. Or the labels change and like, what's going on with this? Or where's what helped me quit? Well, it's new regulations. I can't imagine how much of our population doesn't even know that COP9 is happening. They don't even know what FCTC is. All they know is that things are changing and it's the whole boiling frog syndrome. Everybody deserves its proper democracy to have a voice in this. Everybody. I'm not coming here with a big high education. I went to a trade school in high school. I don't even know how to type. I, I tried it. It just doesn't work for me. I head peck. And I'm sitting here surrounded by all this armed to the gills with what it will take to formulate things the right way with the right flavors and the right documentation and the right science, and you're not listening, and it's not fair. Thanks for letting me get that off my chest. I love you guys. Hey, hey, you know what? No you. good deed. We love you, and no good deed goes unpunished. Sorry, I'm sitting here eating in your face, but I've been up no. since like five. Okay, sorry, I'm um, crying in yours. Sorry to hear about your dad. Yeah, it sucks. That sucks. Um. 
I kind of I kind of elucidated a little bit last night about my mother. I didn't get the whole story in there. Um, this is going to be very interesting, and some people, if they're old enough, may actually remember this. Um, obviously, I'm originally from the states. My mother um, had rheumatic fever as a child. She was born in the 30s, and back then, you had strep throat. There was no penicillin. And of course, they didn't know what the hell rheumatic fever was really either at that point. She didn't know she had rheumatic fever until she was in her 50, 48 when she had her first heart attack and they saw the damage to her heart. But I digress. My mother always wanted to quit smoking from the time I was probably in primary school. So let's say early 70s, right? Um, and she tried and she couldn't do it. And she couldn't do it. And she couldn't do it. And finally, her GP got her on a trial out of the University of Pennsylvania. It was run in co I think it was through Stony Brook University at that time when Stony Brook started up. And it was for a nicotine inhaler thing that looked kind of like a cigarette. It looked like a nicotine inhaler. It probably was the study for the nicotine inhaler, to be honest. I don't know. I got 1979. I was like 12, 13, whatever. The point is, my mother got put on this study, okay? And my mother stopped smoking. And she didn't smoke for three months, the entire term of the study, Okay. And then she was supposed to go into stage two of that trial and they stopped it. And she was freaking because she was like, I found the thing that can finally get me off of cigarettes and they're taking it away from me. And that's when she went back to smoking. Um, I don't know if tobacco shut that down. I don't know if pharma shut that down, but what I do know is that some corporate interest, somebody with a lot of money, and not one fuck to give about any one individual is the person who shut that down. And that person is liable for my mother's death. Okay? So the reality is that they know that we can, we, we have, we, if we are given enough information and the proper tools, okay, they know that we can make those determinations about our health. They don't want us to, because if we start doing that, this is my opinion, by the way, all standard disclaimers apply. If we start doing that, that makes them irrelevant. And that's another facet of all of this. They want to tell us what to do and how to do it and why to do it, because A, they're trying to maintain their relevance, and B, they're making money off of our health or lack thereof. Okay? That's the number one thing that makes us so effing scary. I'm trying to control myself because Patrick will never let me live it down if I start swearing like a sailor. Um, you know, that's it. We're scared. We scare them because like I was saying, you know, they expect us to be, they have an idea. See, these are people that are so far removed from realities, especially our reality that they have these ideas in their head of who we are. They don't know who we are. They don't want to know who we are. But it gets to the point where they can't ignore us anymore because the idea that they have of who we are is completely wrong, okay? And here we are, and we actually are professional people. I mean, it, Liana, I don't give a crap if somebody doesn't have a college degree. I don't give a crap if somebody doesn't have a high school degree. Because the kind of intelligence and knowledge that comes from here is a hell of a lot more important than the pieces of paper you have on the wall. There are plenty of people I know that have a piece of paper on the wall and it's probably only good for wiping their ass. Okay? Because an education... No, seriously! Because an education doesn't give you integrity. It doesn't give you empathy. It doesn't give you compassion. Okay? Amen. I didn't it learn doesn't... anything, really, except how to write. Yeah, I mean, I learned how to write and research. Okay, great. But, you know, <laughs> exactly. the point is, you know, people, the human beings for the most part, okay, they're weird animals. We know this. But those who have a, are, who are able to get to a place of privilege feel entitled to it. And it's their thing. And they don't want anybody doing anything that would threaten it. We threaten that bubble, that entitlement, that privilege. So that's why... They're kind of reacting like, you know, a hurt animal. You know when an animal gets hurt in the wild, right? What do they do? They flip out. They get very – because they know that if they get hurt and other equal animals or bigger animals find them, they're dead. 
this is what's going on right now. So it's, it's, it's a defensive reaction as opposed to an offensive reaction. And you know what? You've got to think about this in a way. That's actually a good thing in a way. Because now they realize that, that, that life isn't just going to smooth like this. There's a threat. Do you understand what I'm saying? All too well. Okay. All too well. It's it, and, and what I see that's happening is they're taking, they're taking us, making sure that we stay sick. Because yeah. behind the guise that we don't want you to smoke, they do want us to smoke because otherwise they're going to lose all the excess money and taxes and all that stuff from the syntax and push this all in the hands of pharma to make sure they're still profiting. And they're the ones that, you know, only are allowed to put out like certain devices. And I see this all over the world now. Like they want you sick because they make money as much money off you. You're just like a number until you die. There's so much more under, money. Yeah. I think in that. The new under the guise. Yeah. Yeah. Under the guise of being public health. Well, guess what? You're not the ones that I want making my decisions for me. I want everyone that's been on this scope and some others that, you know, didn't have the opportunity to be here to make part of this decision process. They're you guys are trying so hard. Like Kasa has made it so easy to 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 sign an email that's already been written for you and and I throw money in there you know they've mm -hmm. made it so easy we have the information but people are afraid yeah. and and they've been bold enough to like you know make some of the golden oldies videos and and do things like that and able to to present their story but it's not being heard because it, it's it's squelched or it's held heard by just so few people they don't have the chance and i didn't mean to cut you off nancy i'm a raw as f okay right now it's but okay. that's that's what they're trying to do it's all a big money making machine well i'm letting you know we see right through it we see what you're doing we know what you're up to i don't care how much money you have the truth is going to stand when all this comes down the mm -hmm. truth is going to be put out there it's 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 not okay and i'm going to be sitting here waiting because i i you know i wanted to say yeah i'm going to throw my pirate hat on and i'll i'll do whatever i can to help a fellow smoker but mm -hmm. like i'm terrified of stepping into that realm i don't want to be a part i really want to do this the right way give me a freaking chance make this thirty six thousand dollars and all the hours of work that i put out on top for this llc just to say in business be worth it I'll yeah. work with whatever different types of nicotine I have, salt, regular nicotine, TFN. Why do I have to, why did I have to stash a gallon of nicotine in my freezer for myself to do what I do? Yeah. Why did I have to like change everything? I understand the chemicals and chemistry and all that. Yeah. Okay. I get it. I'll work by your rules, but let me have a chance to do it. Yeah. Not just pharma, yeah, not just I, big tobacco with money. But Liana, we're talking about people, okay? And in their mindset, and Jan, you can jump in at any time. I know you're just sitting there observing because that's what Jan does. And she will speak when she's ready to speak. So I'm just reminding you. Um, you know, we have to remind them that we're not commodities. These people operate in a world where it, unless it's directly and personally affected to them, the rest of it's all commodities. It's a commodification of people. Yep. OK. And, you know, th when you when you commodify something, OK, when you put a dollar value and that's exactly what this is, when you put a dollar value on a human life, you've lost your humanity. That's it. Full stop. OK. And it, it's kind of surprising to me. And, and I'm going to bring something up that I said I wasn't going to do, but I'm going to do it anyway. OK. Um, you know, we're talking about COVID before people were talking about COVID and whether you're vax or not, I don't even want to get into that discussion. Okay. Um, but there are people that are saying, Oh, it was created, you know, to, by the, a certain country, you know, to decimate people and whatever. And there's all these different stories going around. Never mind that. How many governments are using COVID to push through agendas on nicotine? Exactly. Behind closed doors. Okay. Oh, don't get me started on that one. Okay. I mean, the CDC. Lindsay, here, go. 
going. Well, I mean, you knew there was something alarming last year when the CDC decided to quit, uh, you know, publishing data on comorbidities. Because at one point it came out and 2% of the d- deaths, um, they were current smokers. 3% were former smokers. So with that data, it means, wow, a former smoker had a greater chance of dying from COVID. And you saw, I went through and looked at some of the state health departments because I was already following them with the eVally crap. And it was amazing because you had about four of them that were also releasing data on their comorbidities. And then they stopped because it was like in Oregon, it was like 2% or something of their cases. And that was scary to me when I saw them do that. And then I know Phil, bless his heart on Twitter. He's been, you know, tracking all of these studies. There is some weird case with smokers not dying from covid i mean or not getting it i and i don't even know exactly what it is because they're shutting the data down and every time you go to a healthcare provider the first thing they ask you is if you smoke you know that they have the data on whether the smoking status so that just pisses me off and when they try to do any policy based off of covid i want to like you know check it at the door because you should honestly there might be if they have the data couldn't you imagine them telling people, hey, light, light them up. You're not going to get COVID. I mean, that would be amazing, but they would never do that. So, yeah, that one just pisses me off. I got a full mouth. Sorry. Sorry, guys. Sorry. No, right. Nancy, you need to eat. You know, yeah, this eat, is impromptu, and, and I appreciate it. Yeah. And, um, I mean, they did the same thing with Eve Ally, though. I mean, I knew yeah. it. I, you know, I knew actually... I mean, I know what dang vapes were. I knew what they were in 2018. I remember in 2019 telling some guy at the bar, I was like, that's a fake weed brand. It's like April. And they're like, what do you mean? And I was like, dude, look at it. I was like, it's got flavors they're not allowed to have. They don't even let that nicotine, let alone like Skittles. Skittles isn't going to put their you know name brand on any marijuana product. So when it came out in August, I was like, Dude, I bet you it's dang fake. It's fake weed brand. And I was able to do some digging into like just how fake this brand was. I found the empty packaging on Amazon. I found the empty uh, cartridges that you can just fill whatever you want. And if you know, like, you know, marijuana, in order for you to make it, you know, vapable, you have to like cut it with something pretty much. I found a YouTube video instructions on how you could take flower marijuana, use a hair straightener, and like melt it down into wax. I mean, I was like, that's amazing. I mean, wow. I mean, I could be a marijuana entrepreneur if I wanted to. But it was scary when the CDC was ignoring that. And you did have state health departments that were giving that data out, that were actually looking at it and then telling their people, hey, avoid these brands or these quote unquote fake brands. The CDC did not come out and tell it like it that it was dang face until December. And it was 56% of the freaking cases were dank vape brands. And then then they had the other ones come out because I saw it, you know, in the black market when that you can't get dank vape packaging anymore. <laughs> but um, that yeah. was when it was almost like the CDC was sitting there, you know, like, oh, yay, finally, we have some bad cases, you know, all these people and it's vaping. Yes, we finally have it, you know, that we can shut this down. And you saw how they reacted with that. You had all these flavor bans coming out and not, and these politicians not understanding that you're just creating a ban on a product that's going to cause more lung injuries because you're pushing it into a black market. So, yeah, don't get me started on that one. I don't know if you guys all saw Bloomberg's giving $120 million for the opioid epidemic. And it's like, really? You don't understand. Like, you obviously do not get the opioid epidemic and why it's so bad. You're seeing that you're advocating for bans on tobacco products. I mean... So, uh, yeah, but it's a joke. A little man with a Napoleon complex. He's a little man with a Napoleon complex. Um, let's go back to COVID for a minute. Okay. Last January, I had Ileana staying with me at my house. Jan, you remember this? Nod, yes or no? Yeah. I had Ileana staying with me. And, um, that's when the first, we were first hearing about COVID here in New Zealand. Okay. It was before my last trip to Manila, which was the last time I ever got on a plane. Anyway, um, and she was talking and it was she, Mark, and I sitting at my kitchen table one night. And she was talking to me and Mark about how nicotine has a protective effect against SARS. And the the, the chemical pathway, I wish she was here because she could explain it because she's so good at explaining this shit. But basically, it came down to, you know, nicotine has a protective effect. And... She actually presented this to Farsa and Pelosa, and they did study it, okay? And, yeah, it does, but they don't want people to know that. 
they didn't want people to know that. So what it boils down to is nicotine is a bit of like a wonder drug in many different ways. And like with any other drug that comes from the natural world, pharmaceutical companies want to be able to create something, put a patent on it, and have the right to it. What they don't realize, okay, and the same uh, kind of applies with tobacco with, with the um, First Nations and indigenous populations. What they don't realize is they can't patent nature. They can't. They can try. They can come up with synthetics and all that other shit, okay? But that's what this is about. It's the commodification of human health. Exactly. That's Jan, exactly what it is. Jan sitting there just like... I think there's a number of things at, at play here, actually. Um, I think what has happened is that um, uh, tobacco control have been very successful at making people dislike smokers. And the thing is that when you stop smoking, um, especially if you're doing something that looks a little bit like smoking, you're still one of those people. You're the same person. So it's kind of like people have some kind of um, moral um, objection to you as a person because you've done something stupid. You started smoking and, you know, so. You, you know, started self-medicating is what self we said. Self-medicating, yeah. And I mean, and it's funny. And what Jan, what you're saying is they're criminalizing people for behavior. I'm not criminalizing oh, anybody for drinking or for having a cup it, of coffee. Sorry. I think it's more of a um, not criminalizing, but um, not respecting, shaming. Um, not yeah, shaming, not thinking that you have any value. Yep. You actually don't count because you're not the right person. Well, yeah, you look at the way, I mean, that's the way that taxes on such products, you know, like, oh, you're doing something bad. It's an excise tax. You know, we use those technically to kind of deter people from behavior. So, you know, that's why when you start putting an excise tax on tobacco harm reduction products, it's just kind of oxymoronic in the sense that you should be promoting them um, or if anything like subsidizing them. But like, I've got a theory here in the States with all the MSA money and the taxes that and they always want to do like healthcare for all, start the program, start it with smokers. They already pay so much on a pack of cigarettes that's just going to government, you know, put it into a healthcare program. It'd be funded. They, you know, they don't live long enough. So, I mean, they probably have a lot of money on it, but there is that public shame on it um, that, you know, and even I kind of saw it too, a little bit like back, like when I first got into vaping too, that I saw, cause I, you know, as a smoker, I was like, I remember just going to a vape shop and this guy was a complete D-bag to me. I, he's like, I can tell you're a smoker. I mean, he was like the worst. And like, if you know, former smoker, like, come on, man, you quit smoking too. I mean, you can't look down on, on smokers. Um, so I, yeah, it's a shame on them. Definitely. Um, and that, and another example in the States is that, you know, with the build back uh, better, you know, that they're the, the way that Joe Biden promised that he wasn't going to raise taxes on $400,000 or less. And they're trying to like pivot away from that. Well, it's not a household good. And it's like, really, I mean, not only that this is a $400,000 or less, you know, tobacco taxes are regressive because, you know, poor people smoke at greater rates. So exactly. That's where I came from. Poor people. A person that was uh, by choice, a net case, out on the streets, just surviving and not even realizing that I was self-medicating and then, you know, pulled my head out of my butt and my life got changed. I am all those representations of all the studies that the scientists have been trying to put forth and my advocate peers have been trying to put forth and saying, these are the ones you're hitting the hardest. Imagine what we could do for actual THR if every penny of that MSA money went towards it just in the States. Uninfluenced by Bloomberg. Imagine if it was actually used for what it was meant to be used for instead of uh, filling every other gap where your budget doesn't meet because you don't know how to spend right. 
imagine. Yeah. But I mean, it's like what H was saying last night. I don't know if you caught any of it. You know, what if Bloomberg spent the money on THR instead of on tobacco? Yeah. Instead of his anti-campaign. If he took that billion dollars a year or whatever the hell, he's got all those figures. Um, if he took all that right. money and, and, and did it on something positive instead of something punitive. Exactly. Why did he just like, put it towards his data for health initiative? Screw it. I mean, I, honestly, he could have went down in history for being able to address COVID if he actually spent his tobacco money towards that program. Right. The, the, yeah. the problem is the side effects. It's the tar and all the crap that comes with it. It's not the nicotine. The problem is not the nicotine. Nicotine is about as harmless as oh. caffeine. So, yeah, I saw somebody today that they sent a letter regarding cop nine and they were trying to sit here and say that nicotine causes type two diabetes. I've, I, that was a new one for me. I was like, I'm going to have to go do some research on that one. But I was just like, what, like, where, where are you getting this from? Um, you know, I mean, it's this, and I've seen this progressively. Like I wrote a book, um, with Dr. Radu back when I was at Heartland, like when I first started, it was kind of like one of the ways I kind of got thrown into it. Actually, I think I have a copy of it. Um, if you want one, I can send them to people. Uh, but I remember, you know, talking about nicotine and then it became, yeah, vaping, e-cigarettes, policy, my first book I wrote. And Yay. yeah, um, uh, they've gotten a lot better. Okay. Um, I want one. <laughs> but I just remember, you know, when Dr. Rardu did a really good job kind of like explaining nicotine and he's done, you know, he's done a lot of work on like snooze and, and smokeless. I mean, he's like one of the earlier pioneers you know before vaping was even around and you know that they have the similar properties caffeine elevates your heart you know it, it, it does you know kind of create some anxiety the same way that you know because your heart beats faster but relatively benign as far as it doesn't really do anything there's no chemical you know mm -hmm. craziness happening and i also where when did they forget like remember like back in the 90s where they used to say that you could quit smoking in like three days because it's like out of your system yeah, like, I remember like that. Like getting through. I mean, so this is like, so then you see these things that they're like, oh, it's as addictive as heroin. And I've done a lot of research on the opioid epidemic, and I definitely know opioid addiction is one of the hardest addictions. It does rewire your brain. So that just pisses me off on this whole demonization of nicotine and that, you know, we're losing some of the things that nicotine could actually be treating. Exactly. I mean, seriously, I'm going to say this. The most fucked up thing to me is that they're going after vaping and nicotine. But they're leaving the thing that has a 50% chance of killing half of its users or kills half of its users perfectly legally on the market. Right. That tells you everything you need to know. That's exactly it. You know, my favorite tax plan that I saw out of all the research that you um, had me read, Nancy? No, the well, tax plan from the Royal, was it the, it was the Royal College of Physicians had like a tax layout? It uh, might have been. I don't know. I sent you so okay. much shit. You did. You said, okay, and, and all that shit, so now that we're cussing, that you sent me to read and digest, okay, which yeah. which I did, there was a basic tax plan that made it really, really simple. You want to keep taxing the most harmful thing, and then you want to not tax, untax, tobacco harm reduction, yay, people live longer, but unfortunately to them... And I love the way you said, you know, making us, I don't, can't remember the phrase right now. You're camaraderizing. Commodification. Commodification of people. <laughs> I got to use a yeah. new word. It's my word of the day. Commodification. I love yes. it. Okay. The commodification of people, it doesn't keep us sick and therefore from and making money. Well, there's plenty of other things that you can make money on. There's plenty of other things. And. And we're real people. And if if we're such losers, how are we able to, you know, like have all this research and all this this stuff done? I mean, you look at the few politicians that that have have picked one of these up and tried it to quit and listen to their testimonies. They're the only ones that are going to really, really make an impact because now they've got the bone in their mouth and they're ready to run with it because they realize it's affected them personally. It worked. And, or it may be a snooze pouch or, you know, I finally saw my first heat, not burn device in a casino the other day. My very first one, I was fascinated to sit right next to her uh, and I had a, that went much longer. I, the last one you see I know too. <laughs> I had a conversation. She's got a China hookup. How do you uh, think okay. I get all my hardware? I formed an LLC just to be able to buy my hardware where you guys could, the, not you guys, 
but they now couldn't I know stop I'm me. Up for stuff. <laughs> they couldn't stop me. Okay. That's what I did. You know, how am I going to get a caliber G to, to like someone else if it's not available? I mean, things are still available, but Nevada itself is down to one supplier, one distro. Everybody is carrying the same things unless they hook up with an awesome company like Five Ponds and get shipped directly that pays the 30% wholesale oh, tax insane. on top of your prices that get passed on to you and they want to add another tax to that. That's just my state. You know, yeah. Patrick's really talking. Hold on a minute. Patrick, what are you trying to say? Actually, depending on heart condition, blood pressure, and a few other factors, yes, nicotine and caffeine can do that. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it was interesting because Asa mentioned something yesterday. Asa said, you know, if somebody's a heavy smoker and they quit immediately, like cold turkey, boom, that could kill them. Yeah. I had them put a patch on my dad while he was in, in the facility. Because he couldn't get his, he couldn't, he was peeing all over everything. He didn't even know, like, where he's at, like, what's going on. I said, slap a nicotine patch on my dad. He smoked his whole life. All right? Mm. And within a few months, guess what? My dad's behavior yeah. settled down. He liked getting dressed and being put in the hallway to eat. Yeah. You know? He calms right down, and then they were able to take the patch off, and he stayed in that state. Thank you, nicotine. Yep. There it's you go. It's insane. It is. It's absolutely insane. And yet then, I had to harp on the nurses to get them to do that. I had to fight with the nurses when my dad was in um, my dad was in the oncology ward. Here's the, I'm going to tell you another story, actually. Um, just divulging everything. Everybody's going to know all my secrets. Um, okay. My dad worked on the lunar module. My dad worked for Grumman Aerospace. And he was an aeronautical electronic engineer. And so he was crawling around inside the lunar module running all the wires for all the electronics. Okay, which to this day, it amazes me that, you know, yeah, we've got this in my hand and then listening to the stories of the things that, yeah, anyway, nevertheless. Um, and he smoked as well. And I remember seeing him. I went back to New York in 2010 because my uncle Jimmy was unwell. Okay. And I met my dad up at the local pub and we were hanging out. It was actually the, the night of the Kentucky Derby. So it was in May of some time. But anyway, um, and I looked at my father and Liana, you're going to understand this. And I knew something was wrong. I knew something was horribly wrong with my father. Couldn't put my finger on it, but I knew something was wrong with him. Go back to New Zealand, get a phone call. My brother tells me, yeah, dad's got cancer. I'm like, what? And then all of a sudden, you know, the alarm bells in my head. Oh shit. That's what I was picking up on. Right. Even though I couldn't boil down or drill down to it and they found stuff they found tumors in his pleura so that's the lining of your lungs okay and they went and did the um, biopsy and it was pleural mesothelioma which is mm. to some people they call it asbestosis okay and that mm. comes not from smoking that comes from exposure to asbestos fibers okay fiber you know whatever yeah asbestos now when they found out that my father was a smoker, now understand something else here as well. My father was in the United States Air Force. He was in the military. He was one of the first guys that actually set up the Strategic Air Command. Um, but because he was a smoker, okay, they did not want to officially ICD code him for pleural mesothelioma because then it would have to be reported back, I think, to the Department of Defense as a work injury because of his work on the space program. Huh. So wow. I got a hold of the oncologist who was a major dickhead and I'm just going to dickhead. Okay. Dickhead. And, um, I said, you know, what the hell are you doing? You know? And he's like, no, I, you know, I, I, I was told that, you know, it's easier to code and get him the better treatment. I'm like, no, I said, you can't just put down lung cancer. You have to put down the type of lung cancer. Oh, it doesn't matter. He's a smoker. Now. Wow. He, let me tell you something. That son of a bitch was real lucky. I was in New Zealand. And he was in New York. Okay. I can't finally get to New York about two months later. You know, that son of a bitch wouldn't come and talk to me. He'd see me coming and he'd hide because he knew what was going to, what was coming at him because I knew his boss because I used to work for him. So I called his boss up on the phone. Good for I you. Said, hey, Tom. What the fuck? Right. And Tom's like, uh, I'm like, Tom. Um, the doctor, the oncologist, put on my father's death certificate lung cancer. He never changed it. Now, 
my thing is, you know, okay, yeah, maybe he could have put the right thing down and maybe there could have been an investigation or money or whatever from the Department of Defense. It wasn't about the money, okay? It was never about the money. It was about doing the right thing and they didn't because he was a smoker. It all boils down to truth. And that's what it we're standing up for is truth. And that's it. It boils down to truth. Okay. I have no problem telling the truth. I, I, you know, I'm sometimes known as the teller of unpopular truths. I mean, you know, I can be brutal. I admit that. Okay. But my intent is not to cause harm. My intent is to let's speak the truth because I'm so fucking sick of all the bullshit from the machine. Okay. How many other people do you think got, got treated the same way? That is exactly what happens. If you're a smoker or a former smoker and you get cancer, good luck. They did the same thing with COVID patients. Um, they could have died from something else, but they just smacked COVID down there as a reason, you know, for monies and payouts. It's greed sucks. You guys see me use that hashtag greed sucks. Greed well, does suck. Time. Okay. But. If you give us a chance, we can show you how to make money and we can have our cake and eat it too. And everybody can be profitable and pour more money into, into, um, our, our, our environment around us. Cause right now I just can't think of words, but we'll spend more money on other things because we're making more money. We'll be healthy and we'll be fired up and there's other things to come against, but well, not nicotine, not caffeine, not alcohol, not like we just leave them alone the thing i don't understand in the united states and i say this as somebody who spent the first 39 years of my life living there okay the thing i don't understand about the united states is it used to be a place where small mom and pop businesses that was the, the backbone the backbone of the united states and i sit here for, in new zealand and i look at what's going on there and i'm like because it's just it's just a wholesale destruction of family businesses in favor of corporates. And it's the wholesale destruction of an independent business. I think Amanda probably covered this, but you know, they, they, they're, they're so against the tobacco companies, right? They're so, oh, they're the, the you know, the, the antichrist, let's just say, okay? They're handing it straight to them. Exactly. And I have to explain to lawmakers all the time when they're like, oh, va vaping's just big tobacco, especially here in the States. Like, you know, let's just do the, let's do the history here. E-cigarettes came to America in 2007. It wasn't until 2011 that big tobacco purchased blue, Lorillard. And then you had the same, 2012 is when you had views. And I think that's when Mark 10 came out as well. I mean, and Mark 10 sucked so bad that they pulled it back. I mean, but, you know, and they got into it. I remember talking to to one of I think it was British American Tobacco at like some conference one time and like they admitted I was like y'all kind of thought this was a gimmick I mean big tobacco did think vaping was a gimmick at first you know it isn't gonna last and it did and it was consumers and actually most of the innovation that you do see that comes out of vaping still to this day is coming from consumers it's not coming from big tobacco exactly I mean I'll give and the consumers got into the business because they found something that worked for them and they wanted to share with other people. Yep. Mm -hmm. They're not used car salespeople. Right. You know? So why aren't the innovators included? The innovators need to be included. We know it better than you do. Okay? That's all there is to it. We yeah. know our industry better than you do. But we we're willing to better. make it as safe as possible. In any but means we, necessary, but you don't eliminate flavors. Um, don't yeah. eliminate s sweeteners that have such high burn points that, and they're, and they're non-carcinogenic. Mm -hmm. Don't limit us on any in, on any of the fronts. Don't. But we can all come together and work together, but we all need to work together. And we yeah, can make this successful. Uh, let us have our businesses too. It shouldn't just be put in the hands of a pharma and big tobacco. Well, going, we do. We're going I know we do. They don't. And the reason they don't is because that it's a control issue. Roberto brought it up this morning. I don't know how much you call it Roberto's thing, but you know, it, it's, 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 it's uh, oh crap. Not just went right out of my head. It's um, social engineering. That's what he said. Social engineering. That's what we've come down to. I don't know how many people have read the book um, Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. I know it's kind of like way out there, but as he was talking, <laughs> that was what was popping through my head. Okay. 
alphas and de deltas and epsilons <laughs> and you know is, right Lindsay am I right yep okay well what pisses me too off about vaping, and I saw it like this year, um, that you have they put regulations in there that like pick and choose business winners, and I really want to like you know for the the tobacco for the lawmakers that don't not care about tobacco harm reduction. That's the angle I think I'm going to go hit them at. Yeah, I remember being in a hearing out in like North Dakota. There was a flavor ban one day and or a tax one day, and then there was an um, online sales ban the next day. And like the C store guy comes out and he's like against the tax then the next day he's like he's for the online ban and i'm like f that you know you shouldn't have the privilege of getting government regulations to snuff out your competition all right sorry that's not only crony i mean lawmakers should be that pissed you know pissed off about it i think one of the ways too with the doing with the fda is like start going to your lawmakers that hate the federal government you know and be like your federal government is now picking winners and choosers uh, sorry winners and losers how do you feel about that well, I mean, it, it all plays. It, it all plays down into the multi. It's like a, um, like I said this morning, it's a hydra, right? It's not just big tobacco, and it's not just big pharma. It's the media. You know, this is a very well. Don't kid yourself. This is a very well organized and orchestrated project. Okay, and that's why I oh, brought up the Aldous Huxley. Absolutely, book. it is. Okay, and a lot of people, and I, it, 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 as much as it sucks to say this, a lot of people are quote unquote sheeple. They believe the shit they see on the idiot box because somebody's standing there and they allegedly call themselves an expert. And Jan, you know who I'm thinking of here in New Zealand, right? Yeah, she's smiling. Um, this is the problem because now, you know, we know, okay, the average Joe doesn't know, but if the average expert, expert is out there spouting a bunch of bullshit but because they're an expert people believe that that's the truth so one of the pillars yeah, of, oh, yeah one of the the fence posts i guess for whatever work with me here that has to come down yeah we can go after you know the the politicians we should okay because we have to humanize this and we can go after you know these academics because you know they're so shit scared of losing their relevance and their funding with the media companies because i don't know i mean i'm maybe i'm naive idealistic i don't know i remember walter cronkite and harry reasoner and oh, yeah. you present the facts yes the facts okay <laughs> media has become it's almost like um how do i put it if you're a journalist sorry if you're a journalist sorry journalist not sorry you're supposed to present the facts and allow people to make a decision, make the, make the judgment and, and, and give them the information that they need to make form an informed position or opinion, okay? It's all being spoon-fed. And it's all being spoon-fed because of advertising money. So if the advertiser doesn't like the position that they take, so that's why they put all this sensationalistic bullshit out because most of it now is online. So the more clicks you get, the happier the advertisers it all boils down to money but there's different little branches of all of this that have to be hit and it needs to be a coordinated action yes we need to humanize and to the talk to the politicians and our elected representatives and if they fuck up don't vote for them okay but by the right. same token you've got to remember that you've got to reach out to these people and talk to them and, and, and make a human connection with them because chances are they don't know and there may be somebody there that wants to know Okay. Same thing with these academics. Okay. You know, you, you humanize this, but you can't just hit one thing and you can't just vote a single issue and you can't just say everything is black and white because it's not. Right. And I think a lot of advocates forget that this is not a single thing. This is all these different things that are feeding into it. And you've got to address all the different things that feed into it. And the more we do it and the louder we get about it. Okay. The more they're going to be like, Ooh, because if we're not watching their TV show, and we're not clicking on their website, they're losing money. So where do you hit people who are concerned about money? You hit them in the pocketbook. Yeah, they finally, Wall Street Journal finally had a decent article about vaping the other day. It was like a surprise. Yeah, I did. They actually, they even got the, um, I mean, it was behind a paywall, uh, of course, but they actually even got the uh, youth use, like, you know, like defining it, like, 
at at least one occasion in the past 30 days. I was impressed with that one. I was like, it's about time when you journalists like, you know, started, you know, helping out these lawmakers with their numbers and their math because they don't know how to do it. That's another thing that we can do is when a journalist or someone speaks out and manages to get out there and presented, respond to them. Yep. Tell them thank you. Say that we're behind you. You know, like beef them up encourage them clap your hands to them they need to hear it you know we it's politicians journalists scientists researchers people who are willing to tell the truth need us to support them because they're one of us and they're up against a lot of shit yeah and that's the only reason i'm here is because you guys chose to do the same thing with me you encouraged me you supported me you said yeah come on be heard it's terrifying oh well it's 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 a worthy cause and despite my personal circumstances like i needed to do this i needed to do it to just say you know hey i'm willing to put myself out on front street and y'all are staring at my bedroom and this is what i do this is what i've been doing this is what i'm about and anything i'm tight with money i don't even own a television and i don't have cable Okay, I don't, I don't t- watch I have television, the news. but I don't watch it. <laughs> I de- I don't. You know, wow, my news is either. my news is Twitter, Facebook, real facts. You guys like that that that's it. You know, that's that's all I'm I'm fed off. I'm like I keep myself isolated from all of it because I'm I see through the BS and I'm like sick of it. It makes me sick yep. to my stomach. Mm-hmm. Media is one of these. Y'all read that? That's what media is. I'll Big, tell you what it is. Giant cluster fuck. Cluster <laughs> fuck. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm tired of the lies and I'm not paying for your BS and your bull crap advertising and things that you think that matter. And I'm trying to tell you what matters. And so, you know, like, like Roberto, I have to just say this right now. I love him. Roberto, thank <laughs> you for making pure, truthful science easy to understand, having that sense of humor and taking the time to present it. I want you yep. on Netflix. I want to watch this documentary. I want so many of these, you know, Dr. Shree, all these amazing advocates and people. This is the kind of stuff I want to digest. This is what I want to learn about. And other people yeah. may not want to learn about it, but I do. Yeah, I do. no, that's cool. That's cool. All right, we're almost done here. We actually went over time, so we <gasps> not as much as the boys because, well, yeah. Lindsay, final thoughts. <laughs> I mean, just keep kicking butt, you know. Thank you for having me on again, uh, all you wonderful ladies. Liana, uh, my thoughts are with you and your family right now if you need anything, you know. But you keep kicking ass, too. So, uh, you know, sure, we're going to have a we're gonna have a fun 2022 coming up. So that's oh, good. Oh, yes, we are. Yes, we are. And by the way, everybody, I have to thank Lindsay because Lindsay is the one who helped me do the social media campaign for all of this. So. I should have done more. I'm sorry. You my, did more than enough. Thank you. Me right now. So, God. Thank you. All right, Miss Jan. Yeah, Liana, I'm so sorry for your loss. Um, yeah, I lost my father last year. I kind of, I do get where you are at the moment. Um, and um, Nancy, thank you so much. You really deserve a holiday after this. Hopefully, I can get out of Auckland and have one. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> see if you can get out of Auckland. <laughs> Escape from Auckland. Um, Liana, I know this was rough for you. I'm so proud of you. I'm so, so proud of you, girlfriend. And I'm so, so mm-hmm. sorry about your dad. Um, you know, I'm here if you need me. But thank you for coming and joining us. Thank you for having me on. I really, really do appreciate being able to have a voice and I encourage anyone out there who's, who is listening, who's comprehending all this to go ahead and take just a few minutes a day, like even 30 minutes, go on Twitter, you know, retweet. If you don't have time to write your own, that's fine. Retweet what is true, what has good standing behind it. And if I can come along and just be a cheerleader for my advocates that have been in the game so freaking long, been in the trenches so long, please don't give up. Please keep fighting. Please don't, please don't stop what you're doing. What you're doing is incredible. And and if we keep going in this direction, eventually we're going to be heard because I believe in what Hennage says. We're going to win. We're going to win. Losing is not an option. Nope. Yes, Samra, we love Shree. Shree knows we love her. We keep telling her that. So, um, but thank you for acknowledging that. He's saying he's acknowledging you bringing up Shree. 
Um, everybody, thank you for joining us. A little surprise. We got to do this more often, girls, I think. What do you well, think? Yes. What do you say? Yes. Yes. A little online coffee clutch, hopefully later in the day or maybe early. I don't know. Maybe I need wine. I'm not doing wine now, but <laughs> Why not? I'm not on. We can have wine. Right, Jan? Let's have wine. It's um, excellent. Absolutely. All right, audience. Thank you very much for joining us. Ladies, thank you very much. And thank you. up next, I think, is Sons of Liberty in an hour or so. So Yay. Yay. Bye. Bye, guys. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank <laughs> you.